All right, here we are in the final chapters of Watchmen. Um, my goal of this video is to help us understand how to characterize Veidt and what he represents philosophically. Um, and in order to do that, uh, Alan Moore sprinkles a lot of hints about Veidt's personality actually across the three final chapters. So I found it difficult to just give one lecture um, on, on each of these chapters individually because I found that uh, that all of the clues that add up to Veidt's personality are, 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 are spread throughout these chapters. So what I did instead was created a central location um, where I kind of pulled a lot of the quotes from the end chapter excerpts especially. And what I want to do is help help us go through um, and categorize some of the various aspects of Veidt's personality. Um, and once we kind of chart each of these different characteristics uh, and look at these quotes, all of which are pulled from these end chapter excerpts, then we can return to the actual graphic novel itself, look at some of the scenes, um, and then connect it to to philosophy itself. Uh, so I figured this would be easier than me trying to kind of flip between various end chapter excerpts, which would be pretty clunky and pretty difficult. Um, but I still wanted us to make sure that we're doing good close reading work, good detective work here to make sure that our conclusions are based on actual evidence. So with that, let, let's start going through these characteristics, which aren't really in a particular order. Um, but you can see from the end chapter excerpts, which are from various letters or interviews that Veidt has with people, uh, we, we gain a lot of insight into what he's thinking. And especially now that we understand his overall plan um, involving the alien monster, we have a better sense of kind of implicitly, uh, or, or we have a better sense of the context in which he is saying some of these statements in. So with that, let, let us get started. I, I think the first thing that we note about Veidt, his first most impressive characteristic, is his sense of self-reliance. Um, and it makes him seem almost superhuman, and he certainly described using that kind of terminology, right? Um, and so some of the stuff he explains in the end chapter excerpts is, for instance, he gave away all his money to charity when I was 17. I wanted to prove that I could accomplish anything I wanted starting from absolute nothing. Also, I wanted to free myself of concern for money. So if you remember, uh, his parents came over, they were immigrants, um, and in addition, they ended up coming across a fair amount of money, and Veidt gives that all away, okay? So he he's not like a Bruce Wayne who is just born into exorbitant wealth and uses that wealth to gain a lot of advantages. Uh, rather, he's the exact opposite. He gives away all of his money and is so impressively self-reliant. He's such a self-made man that he's able to lift himself or pick himself up by his bootstraps um, and become wildly rich uh, beyond, any, beyond anybody's wildest imagination uh, without any help from anybody else. Um, next, you get, this is from Veidt, he says, you get to be a superhero by believing in the hero within you and summoning him or her forth by an act of will. So again, there's a lot of emphasis with Veidt on this idea of an act of will, and he seems to be somebody who has a strong sense of will. He can will um, anything he wants into the world through his determination and effort. Um, another one you see is from a chapter of his book called The Veidt Method, uh, which talks about, it's kind of a self-help book of this is how to achieve uh, self-actualization, self-realization, and it's achieved through an intense training and synthesis of mind, body, and spirituality. And you can see that Veidt has achieved mastery over all of those aspects of, him, of his sense of self. And again, notice the language of superhuman here. It says, quote, our third and longest chapter presents a carefully coordinated series of physical and intellectual exercise systems which, if followed correctly, can turn you into a superhuman, fully in charge of your own destiny. All that is required is the desire for perfection and the will to achieve it. Notice that word will uh, appearing again, this concept of will, uh, the strength of one's will being uh, super important to understanding Veidt. The Veidt method paves, paves the way for a bright and hopeful future in which anyone can be a hero. Again, kind of an echo of that B subpoint quote that I had up here. Um, another quote from the Veidt Method excerpt says, By applying what you learn and ordering your thoughts in an intelligent manner, it is possible to accomplish almost anything. Possible for the ordinary person. There's a notion I'd like to see buried. The ordinary person. 
So obviously the opposite of ordinary is extraordinary. And so you can see here that Veidt tends towards these concepts of the superhuman, the extraordinary, um, a, a truly heroic sense of self-reliance. Um, and this spills into my second point, which is there's a lot of imagery surrounding him about him being godlike. Obviously, his his actual uh, his actual dress itself, like how he his clothes that he wears, looks more um, godlike or king like than any of the other superheroes. Uh, he clearly has a desire to be like Alexander the Great or the Egyptian pharaohs, both of whom had god, god complexes. And this is the reporter speaking who is talking to him. It says, I'd have to I'd have to goddamn admit that he looks like a goddamn god. I can't quite believe he'll submit to being interviewed by someone so obviously mired in the dregs of the gene pool as myself. Um, so again, emphasizing this separation between the ordinary human and Vite, who seems to be superhuman or, or even a god. And then this B sub point, this again from the uh, from the journalist he, or the reporter, he says he takes me for a tour of his fortress, the one that we see in Antarctica, uh, opulent beyond the wildest dreams of Versailles. Versailles being the palace built by Louis XIV, which was meant to symbolize the exorbitant wealth that the French monarchy had. And of course, Louis XIV believed that he was divinely ordained by God. He had the mandate from God to rule. Um, so you can see here that Veidt very much draws similarities between these, uh, between these pre-modern rulers who very much believed that they had a connection to God, that they were superior to regular humans, and Veidt himself. Um, three. In contrast to other characters like the comedian in Rorschach, who I'll talk about in a second, I think this is certainly the most liberal character that we have seen. Um, and here's what I mean by that. Liberal is in left-leaning. And the justification for this is he seems to be more interested in solving the root causes of problems as opposed to implementing theories of justice or liberty, um, things that typically conservative thinkers are more interested in, right? Liberals, meanwhile, typically try to solve the root causes of problems, um, which is why they would justify for instance, uh, passing social services, right? Um, rather than trying to throw uh, drug offenders in prison, a liberal would say, well, what creates um, the drug problem in impoverished communities in the first place? Well, if we can see this, we can see it's more about socioeconomic reasons. Thus, a liberal thinker would say the best way to combat drugs is not to punish drugs, but rather to uh, go about solving the root causes of poverty itself, which will alleviate the symptoms of the system that push people into, you know, gang life, into drug dealing, so on and so forth. Um, whereas a more conservative thinker would say, no, there are rules. If somebody breaks the rules, they should be punished. Um, and obviously we'll get to those disputes as we get to chapter 12. But let's see what um, Veidt says here. Uh, he says, there were a number of reasons why I quit crime fighting. This is to the reporter. But I suppose basically it boiled down to my increasing uncertainty about the role of the costumed hero in the 70s. What does fighting crime mean exactly? Does it mean upholding the law when a woman shoplifts to feed her children? Or does it mean struggling to uncover the ones who quite legally have brought about her poverty? So notice this shift, right? Rather than blame the people who end up in these unfortunate circumstances, blame the system that has pushed these people to these extremes. Yes, I've busted drug rings and been accused of being an establishment pawn for doing so. But I've also uncovered plots by breakaway extremist factions within the Pentagon. For example, the plot to release some unpleasantly specific diseases upon the population of Africa, the exposure of which led to the New Frontiersmen denouncing me as the puppet of Peking on the strength of my youthful travels through the East. So notice here, right, this is another big difference between uh, Veidt and some of the other heroes we've looked at, like uh, like Rorschach and the Comedian. He's willing to expose and criticize the U.S. federal government um, as opposed to being a good patriot. Um, I guess I've just reached a point where I've started to wonder whether all the grandstanding and fighting individual evils does much good for the world as a whole. Those evils are just symptoms, this is the key word um, that cues us into the fact that this is a very liberal thinker, of an overall sickness of the human spirit. And I don't believe you can cure a disease by suppressing its symptoms. So very strong language there at the end. 
um, that very much cues us into the way in which Veidt is thinking about the world, uh, which could allow us to better characterize him as a liberal. And obviously we learn uh, Rorschach obviously hates him and calls him uh, or, or accuses him of having strong liberal affections. We find out Veidt gives a lot to charities, uh, and he's kind of this superstar of Nova Express, which is the left-leaning newspaper, so on and so forth. Um, so we can contrast this with Rorschach's insistence on upholding justice, right, by holding certain individuals accountable even if it never solves the root causes of social evils. If you remember from chapter one, Rorschach wondered, right, is this entire city dying of rabies and is the best I can do to wipe specks of foam from its lips? Uh, and Rorschach says, no matter, right? There is evil, there is good and there is evil and evil must be punished. Rorschach understands he's not solving the root cause of the problem, but still abides by a system of justice because he believes that people need to be held accountable. Um, whereas Veidt clearly turns away from that um, based on this quote. Second, you can contrast it with the comedian's willingness to commit atrocities to further U.S. geopolitical interests, right? The comedian believes the United States is best uh, suited to, to suppressing the brutality of humanity um, through a sheer display of force. And so the comedian sees nothing wrong. In fact, he indulges in the opportunity to be able to reveal his point about the depravity of, human, of humankind um, by acting as a pawn for the U.S. federal government and doing its dirty work, whereas Vite right, wants to expose the federal government for their nefarious plots. Um, next, I would say uh, this should be an independent subpoint. Sorry, it should be like subpoint number four. Um, Veidt has utopian visions of the future. Okay, so this is a different subpoint. Um, and you can see this primarily from Veidt's cosmetics products, all right? And so this is a classic end chapter excerpt where you're like, oh, okay, he's talking about going from this cosmetics line of nostalgia to a new one called Millennium. But I actually think this gives us huge insight into, into Veidt's vision for what happens after the end of chapter 12, which obviously we are not privy to, we don't get access to. Um, but Veidt in this excerpt is writing a letter to his company or to executives in his company saying, that he's ordering them to change the product line. Um, and his he, he kind of justifies why he thinks the future will be different. But we understand, actually, now from knowing the whole plot of Watchmen, that he knows the future is going to be different because he's about to force it to become different through hatching his plot. Um, and so let's see why he changes it from nostalgia to millennium. And by the way, millennium obviously has kind of futuristic uh, connotations to that word, but also has very specific uh, throwback meanings to the idea of the millennium from the book of revelations which is the thousand years of utopian paradise after the second coming of jesus christ after the devil is defeated which uh, is the direct precursor before the eternal kingdom of heaven um so the millennium is viewed as this kind of distant future of utopian peace and prosperity during the second coming of Jesus. Now, obviously, Veidt isn't, doesn't seem to be religious in any way, shape, or form. I don't think he's talking about literally uh, the second coming of Jesus, but certainly those utopian figurative associations are quite strong even his, in his articulation here. So in this excerpt, he starts by talking about um, he starts by talking about the nostalgia cosmetics line, and then transitions to millennium. So let's see, he's talking about nostalgia here. In the soft focus imagery and romantic atmosphere, the advertisements conjure an idyllic picture of times past. <clears throat> it seems to me that the success of the campaign is directly linked to the state of global uncertainty that has endured for the past 40 years or more. In an era of stress and anxiety, when the present seems unstable and the future unlikely, the natural response is to retreat and withdraw from reality, taking recourse either in fantasies of the future or in modified visions of a half-imagined past. Okay, we've talked about this idea before, in this graphic novel, this idea of uh, people trying to retreat into this imagined past that that is much more idyllic and pleasant and peaceful than it actually was. And what Veidt is saying here is the reason why his nostalgia line of cosmetics and that advertising has worked so well is because it's actually linked to the global state of uncertainty. Because there's this looming threat in the Cold War of nuclear annihilation, people do not like the present. Instead, they would rather escape into a past that seemed more simple, more peaceful, more happy, more comfortable, so on and so forth. Um, but Veidt says that this this won't last, right? Global uncertainty won't last. And he says either we'll go extinct or uh, this situation is untenable and we will lead to um, some sort of long-lasting peace. Now, obviously, he's going to create this peace himself through his plan. 
But he says, if peace endures, I contend that a new surge of social optimism is likely, necessitating a new image for Vite Cosmetics geared to a new consumer. So we'll see Vite throughout these chapters very much views his advertising and his products as a reflection of the unconscious desires of individuals and of society itself. And so if he's saying for the past 40 years in the Cold War, the unconscious desire of individuals has been to escape reality because it's so unpleasant, he's saying that the new underlying unconscious desires of humanity um, will be a little bit different, right? They will be based on social optimism. And he says, to this end, starting next year, we'll begin to phase out the nostalgia line of cosmetics and replace them with a new line that better exemplifies the spirit of our, of our anticipated target group. This new line is to be called the Millennium Line. The imagery associated with it will be controversial and modern, projecting a vision of technological utopia. All right, there's the word directly, the idea of utopia. A whole new universe of sensations and pleasures that is just within reach. So we're getting some hint here of the direction that Veidt wants to go in, um, and it's one that's based on unlimited progress, that's based on a technological utopia with a whole new universe of sensations and pleasures. Um, so I imagine this very much being based on maximizing happiness for humanity, um, maybe approaching kind of the direction of a society like Brave New World, which is about maximizing pleasures and sensations for people. Uh, let's keep going. <clears throat> In a different quote, he says, uh, this is to the reporter, I believe, he says, Futurology, study of the future, interests me perhaps more than any other single subject, and as such I devote a great deal of time to its study. Even so, technology is progressing at an ever-accelerating pace, and by early next century I would hesitate to predict any limitations upon what we might be capable of. So notice again here this faith in the idea of unlimited progress due to scientific and technological transformations, right, um, or breakthroughs. He says, I would say without hesitation that a new world is within our grasp, filled with unimaginable experiences and possibilities, if only we want it badly enough. So again, there's, I, I think, a utopian vision here based on technological and scientific progress, if it can be implemented correctly. Um, but nevertheless, um, you can see this language of unimaginable experiences, unimaginable possibilities, a new world being within our grasp. But there's this strong utopian undercurrent to Veidt's, uh, to Veidt's beliefs. Um, and obviously, this requires overcoming the threat of the apocalypse, though, okay? He's not a naive utopian. He understands that the threats are real and it needs to be overcome. And he says this here. It all depends on us, on whether we individual want Armageddon or a new world of fabulous, limitless potential. Again, notice these, these adjectives here. Fabulous, limitless potential. I believe there are some people who really do want, if only subconsciously, an end to the world. They want to be spared the responsibilities of maintaining the world, to be spared the effort of imagination needed to realize such a future. Notice, right, you should be asking yourself, well, who, who is the one who, who wants to uh, hold the responsibility of maintaining a new world, who, wants, who has the imaginative capacity to realize such a future? Obviously, that's Vite, right? And Vite certainly takes responsibility for creating a new world. And certainly, we have to give him credit. He is pretty imaginative in terms of his plot. Uh, I don't think most people would think of trying to hatch an alien invasion as a way to save humanity. Um, I see the 20th century as sort of a race between enlightenment and extinction. All right, so, so Veidt certainly is not a naive utopian. He is a utopian who recognizes the real threats that exist within the current system. Um, and now with these next couple, I can start taking a, taking a look at some, some of the uh, graphic novel itself. Um, certainly, this is probably his most defining characteristic, this one that I'm getting to now, uh, which is his superhuman intelligence. Again, this word, word, word superhuman. Um, he's, quote, called the world's smartest man by every character within the graphic novel. Um, and we can actually see this here uh, if we go do, 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 to the actual chapter the, itself. So we're in chapter 11 right now, or sorry, we're in chapter 10 right now, um, and we get a short little Vite scene here, but we'll see a little bit more of this in chapter 11. So let, let's take a look. So he lands at his nice little place in Antarctica. Um, you can see his servants here. And they ask if he wants to study the monitors, and this is what I want to focus on with his superhuman intelligence. And so he goes on down. Um, he has all his screens on, all, all of them selected to random channel changing every 100 seconds. 
So imagine this, this would be like having 50 YouTube videos open um, and all of them set to change to a different random video every 100 seconds and he's gonna sit there and watch the entirety of them all at once. And his justification, he says, the planet is currently swarming with events in such times none of them are insignificant. I need information, information in its most concentrated form. So Veidt is someone who can process information um, in a superhuman way almost. I, and I think it's, it's super impressive, all the things that I think Alan Moore is so prescient about predicting in terms of the direction society is going, whether it's the, the divisions and the partisanship within media itself between the New Frontiersmen and Nova Express, um, whether, it's the, uh, whether it's the political divisions between the characters themselves, or here in this case, I think what he is predicting is the rise of, of super data processing and the idea of big data. And obviously we're before the point of AI processing capabilities that are so prevalent today that companies like Google or Facebook use in order to sift through vast amounts of information, um, which have become uh, quite contentious and potent in the modern world. But here we have Vite, who is capable of doing it, um, even at a time before all of that data existed, or at least processing capabilities existed. Um, and he is able to do it through, uh, exclusively through his own in in intellectual feats. Um, and his servant says, do you not fear that you might become drunk upon so concentrated a draft of knowledge? And Vite says, no, I do not think so. Indeed, it is the most sobering position that I know. So, right, his uh, his servants kind of saying, isn't having too much knowledge dangerous? A good reference, right, to stories like Frankenstein, and we continue to see references through the Promethean Cab Company to that, to that type of danger of having too much knowledge. And I guess one question we'll have to ask is whether Veidt represents a character like Dr. Victor Frankenstein, um, who we should interpret as being problematic at, because of his pride, his ego, and his desire of mastery over knowledge or whether we view it as a positive thing. Um, that's a question we'll have to continue to explore. So let's see. He comes in here, he starts looking at these screens and immediately he comes to conclusions. He says, first impressions, oiled muscle man with machine guns, cut to pastel, bears, valentine hearts, juxtaposition of wish fulfillment, of wish fulfillment, violence, and infantile imagery. So what did he just do there? He did exactly what we do in our literature class, which is look at concrete images, which are being strewn across the TV screens, and then doing figurative analysis of those, um, arguing that these, that these uh, concrete images are representative of figurative ideas, of a wish fulfillment, of violence, of infantile imagery, of a desire to regress, to be free of responsibility, right? So that's his figurative analysis. He goes from close reading to figurative analysis to then his his conclusion is that war is imminent, right? This all says war and we should buy accordingly. So his company should make purchasing choices based on that conclusion, um, probably based on stocks. And servant says, but sir, we have never bought into munitions. He says, of course not, but you're ignoring the subtext. So the subtext is another way of saying, you know, the figurative meaning. Increased sexual imagery, even in the candy ads. It implies an erotic undercurrent not uncommon in times of war. Remember the baby boom. So Veidt is doing impressive figurative analysis instantaneously on, on hundreds of TV screens all at once to get into the deeper unconscious of what is going on with society and what is going on in individuals um, to better understand what choices, to better understand what predictions should be made about the future. And he says, so we should buy into a uh, invite response into major erotic video companies. That's short term. And also we should negotiate controlling shares in selected baby foods and maternity goods manufacturers. I think I'm ready to begin recording now. So whew, we can see here, right? It's very quick. But, but if you're reading carefully, you get the sense that Veidt is incredibly intelligent. He's able to read society and make predictions in ways that other people are not. He seems almost like an AI supercomputer able to process through vast amount of data instantaneously in order um, to be far ahead of others. And so, okay. And he says, just me. And the, he says, I'm all alone. Just me and the world as he's looking at this. So, okay, pretty, pretty impressive stuff, right? Now, if we go to chapter uh, 11, we get more insight. So obviously, Niall and Rorschach are coming on through. And don't worry, we'll do, we'll do a better close reading of other stuff that's going on within those chapters um, it, um, in the next lecture where I'll look at uh, what's going on with the Black Freighter. 
But okay, chapter 11, it opens up, and now Veidt is doing a much more detailed version of what I was just looking at, where he's looking at all of the screens simultaneously. So, let's take a look. He says, observation. <clears throat> Multi-screen viewing is seemingly anticipated by Burroughs' cut-up technique. So, okay. He's explaining, he's actually justifying what he's doing here. Multi-screen viewing, that's looking at all of these screens simultaneously. Um, and he says it's anticipated by Burroughs' cut-up technique. Uh, Burroughs is a counterculture writer, and the cut-up technique was this technique where literally he would take a text, he would cut it up, all right, into the words there, and he would rearrange them randomly, glue them to a page, and then see what, uh, what, what would emerge. And, and Veidt explains this. He says, he suggested rearranging words and images to evade rational analysis, allowing subliminal hints of the future to leak through. So Burroughs' idea was that if you would actually, uh, if you would actually cut up a text and rearrange it and paste it down, you could actually get hints into what was going on um, in that text uh, in ways that you never would if you just had your rational brain on just trying to understand it in, in the intellectual way that we always try to understand language. Instead, he said that there were, there were uh, recurring codes or implicit, implicit ideas that could only be glimpsed uh, that were subliminal beneath the surface, unconscious, that could only be glimpsed if you rearranged it and saw patterns in a completely new way. And so that's kind of what uh, Veidt is doing here, as opposed to just watching each individual thing and trying to get at, all right, what is this TV show arguing? What is this movie arguing? What ideas are present in this ad? Instead, he's kind of cutting up the entirety of culture that he can see on the TV screen to get subliminal hints into what's going on. Um, again, the way in which we're meant to interpret this is, holy shoot, if you were able to do that instantaneously in the way that Veidt does, that would be deeply and profoundly impressive. Um, and so what, what conclusions does he come to based on his multi-screen viewing? He says, an impending world of exotica glimpsed only peripherally. So I think this idea of exotica links to those earlier quotes that we were looking at, where he describes the future as one of not just limitless potential in terms of technology, but also a whole new world of sensations and pleasures, right? Certainly bodily or physical pleasure seems to be quite important to Veidt. Um, <clears throat> let's keep going. Perpetually, the simultaneous input engages me like the kinetic equivalent of an abstract or impressionist painting. So he's arguing that looking at these multi-screens is like looking at an abstract painting, right? Just like ink blots all over a page. He says, phosphor dot swirls juxtapose meanings coalesce from semiotic chaos before reverting to incoherence. So, so it's like if you're looking at an abstract painting, there's this fine line. You're, you're either realizing that this is beautiful art or it slips into incoherence and you're like, no, these are just random splatters. Um, he says, transient and elusive, these must be grasped quickly. So he still holds to the thought, though, that, that uh, even though the meaning is transient, even though it's only there temporarily, even though it's hard to grasp and elusive, you can grasp it if you do it quickly enough. And he says, computer animations imbue even breakfast cereals with a hallucinogenic futurity, futurity, all right? So even breakfast cereals are kind of implying this, this impressive utopian future. Music channels process information blips, avoiding linear presentation, implying limitless personal choice. So again, notice how all of his conclusions, even if, even if some of this is a little bit confusing, Notice that his conclusions of a world of exotica, a world of limitless personal choice, are feeding into his utopian vision. These reference points established, an emergent worldview becomes gradually discernible amidst the media's white noise. This jigsaw model of tomorrow aligns itself piece by piece, specific areas necessarily obscured by indeterminacy. However broad assumptions regarding this postulated future may be drawn, we can imagine its ambience, we can hypothesize its psychology. So Veidt here is doing impressive work. He's explaining now in this panel, right, his, his method itself. And he is saying that we can draw certain premises from this. We can imagine the tone, the ambience of what this future will look like. We can take uh, guesses about what its psychology will be based on, based on uh, this cut up of all the various things going on. Um, it would be like if you were to watch all the YouTube videos that had come out in 2020, like a really interesting thing to do, right? 
if you were to look at all the YouTube videos of 2019 and the way that Byte's doing, okay? You just have like a hundred different YouTube videos open. Every hundred seconds, it changes to a different video. All the videos that came out in 2019. You'd probably just notice certain subliminal patterns there. Now imagine if you were to flash forward and do that same thing for videos in April of 2020 after the pandemic had started. I'm sure that the subliminal, subliminally, what you would be viewing would be quite different, right? As the videos have probably changed in response to the fears of the virus. Um, and, and so that's what Vite is doing. He's getting glimpses into what's going on in the human psychology of his society um, in order to make good predictions about the utopian future. <clears throat> it says, in conjunction with massive forecasted technological acceleration approaching the millennium, so the millennium that we are approaching is the year 2000 here, right? They are in the late 1880s now. They're approaching the year 2000. Um, and he is forecasting huge technological innovations. <clears throat> Obviously, these did happen, right? The 1990s, early 2000s, and 2010s all feature in, in huge exponential gains in technology. Uh, this oblique and shifting cathode mosaic uncovers the blueprint for an era of new sensations and possibilities. Okay, we've seen that language before. Let's keep going. An era of the conceivable made concrete and of the casually miraculous. And of course, we see this, um, this image here of a tropical forest in Antarctica, which is obviously miraculous and a, and a symbol of the technological feats that, that Vite imagines will become commonplace in the future. All right. So all of this is adding to that utopian vision that we were talking about um, a little bit earlier and, and, and uh, deepening our appreciation for Vite's superhuman intelligence. Um, and of course, this quote, look upon my works, ye mighty, uh, obviously a, a reference to Ozymandias, the Egyptian pharaoh, and we can see the impressive feats here. Now, don't worry, we'll analyze this poem in more depth later on. But let's keep going. Um, As an afterthought, this method has an earlier precursor than Burroughs. In the shamanistic tradition of divining randomly scattered goat innards, the subject for a subsequent discourse, perhaps. So Vida is noting that Burroughs, who was writing in the 1950s and 60s, wasn't the first one to come up with this cut-up technique that actually, if you go back to ancient shamanistic traditions uh, of trying to make sense of, of randomly scattered animal innards, um, you get the same ideas. So anyways, uh, that's, that's what we're seeing here with Vite, and now let's get a little bit of insight into his um, backstory here, but I, I think we're, we're chugging along. Um, and I think what I would argue his backstory represents, if we for a minute go back here, is his singularity of purpose, all right? And, and perhaps this feeds into the first one I was talking about up here, his impressive self-reliance. Um, but I want to go a little bit even further. It, it seems as if Vite has devoted his entire life to a, towards a singularity singular goal and he's done so so impressively that we have to we have to be impressed by his feats right um and so now we can go back whoops now we can go back uh to his backstory which he gives us um over here in this chapter so he invites in all his servants and notice right i think Vite in many ways is the uh is the philosophical opposite of rorschach I think there are good reasons why. Uh, Veidt leans into the moral ambiguities and grayness of the world. Veidt is liberal. Um, but also one thing that is humorously quite different is Rorschach, uh, his monologues are short, they're terse, they use incomplete sentences. Rorschach isn't as much of a talker, actually, even though we see from his journal his thoughts. Veidt, meanwhile, loves waxing eloquently uh, in these long speeches in front of others, and we see that here. Um, all right, so... Veit begins to explain <clears throat> his backstory. Um, he says, today marks an event especially worthy of our attentions, right, of a celebration. In many ways, it represents the culmination of a dream more than 2,000 years old. So, of course, this is the day that he hatches his plot, and he argues that this is the culmination of, of, uh, of a 2,000-year-old dream. And then he gives us backstory back to his childhood. So he says, my parents reached America, 1939. Um, he was already exceptionally bright. Uh, what caused such precociousness? My parents were intellectually unremarkable, possess possessing no obvious genetic advantages. So notice Vite very much does not want us to believe that he was just born smart or born gifted or born rich. Instead, he continues to emphasize that he achieved all these things through his own strength of will. 
He said, I decided to be intelligent rather than otherwise. Perhaps we all make such decisions, though that seems a callous doctrine. By 17, my parents were both dead and I faced a different decision. My inheritance offered lifelong uh, idle luxury and yet needing nothing, I burned with the paradoxical urge to do everything. Do you understand? My intellect set me apart, faced with difficult choices. I knew nobody whose advice might prove useful, nobody living. So he really views himself as being above everybody else. There's nobody even on the same plane as Vite in his mind. He says, the only human being with whom I felt any kinship died 300 years before the birth of Christ, Alexander of Macedonia, or as you guys would understand, uh, Alexander the Great. All right, so this is the only person Vite feels like he could relate to. I idolized him. A young army commander, he'd swept along the coast of Turkey and Phoenicia, uh, uh, subduing Egypt before turning his armies towards Persia. He died age 33, ruling most of the civilized world, ruling without barbarism. At Alexandria, he instituted the ancient world's greatest seat of learning. True, people died, perhaps unnecessarily, though who can judge such things? Yet how nearly he approached his vision of a united world. By the way, this quote, just remember this one, um, it's going to be part of my last point on Vite, which is his willingness uh, to go beyond good and evil to achieve his goals, his willingness to have the, the ends justify the means. Um, let's keep going. I was determined to measure my success against his. Firstly, I gave away my inheritance to demonstrate the possibility of achieving anything starting from nothing. All right, so Veidt very much wants to retrace the steps of Alexander the Great. He admires him, even if Alexander the Great sometimes did morally questionable things. Um, he still embodies the sense of greatness. Um, he says, I wanted to match his accomplishment, bringing an age of illumination to a benighted world. And this language, bringing an age of illumination, um, links to this idea of Prometheus, which we see again. And in the very next panel, we can see it right there, right? The Promethean cab company right above bringing light to the world, a reference to the Greek god who gave humans fire and was then punished by the other Greek gods um, for all of eternity. And then in a text like Frankenstein, it becomes a symbol of uh, of humanity using knowledge for perhaps questionable ends. Um, and so very much we're seeing here this idea of trying to bring illumination to a benighted world um, is putting Vite in line with this Promethean symbolic imagery. Let's keep going. I followed the path of Alexander's war machine along the Black Sea coast, imagining his armies taking port after port. So, okay, he keeps going um, through Veidt's footsteps. And notice, actually, you sh we've actually seen an image almost exactly like this one, um, though not from any character of Watchmen, but instead from a different comic book. Hint, hint. Um, but I will save that for once we finish up the Black Freighter a little bit later. Um, but nevertheless, an interesting parallel. And um, before subduing Phoenicia, Alexander the Great struck north perhaps because of the challenge uh, Gordium presented. The, the ancient world's greatest puzzle was there, a knot that couldn't be untied. Notice we've seen Gordian knot um, imagery before in this graphic novel through the um, locksmith that is fixing Dan Dryberg's lock after Rorschach breaks it. All right, and so the Gordian knot, right? How did Alexander solve this knot, this puzzle that, could, that couldn't be solved, that couldn't be untied? He cut it in two with his sword. And so this is a good symbol, again, of, of either an insoluble, an insol a seemingly insoluble problem being solved through unconventional means. Um, and clearly we see, Al uh, we see not Alexander the Great, Ozymandias resorting to very unconventional needs, uh, means to solve this world problem of conflict between the U.S. and USSR. Lateral thinking, you see, centuries ahead of his time. Um, and so then he goes down to, uh, to Egypt, where he realizes that, um, that Alexander the Great had reinstituted the classic culture of the great pharaohs, had restored it. I followed him through Babylon, up through Kabul. All right, so he goes through Asia, where he had turned back. Okay, Alexander returned to Babylon to die of an infection, age 33. Amongst its ruined ziggurats, I saw at last his failings. He had not united all the world, no, nor built a unity that would survive him. So, okay, Veidt obviously is going to try to create a permanent unity, something that would survive even Veidt. And in this way, he's going to try to surpass even Alexander the Great. Um, 
And so he goes to the desert, eats a ball of hashish. So he takes some uh, mildly hallucinogenic drugs and has a vision quest. And it says, the ensuing vision transformed me. Wading through powdered history, I heard dead kings walking underground, heard fantasy, heard fanfares sound through human skulls. Alexander had merely resurrected an age of pharaohs. Their wisdom, truly immortal, now inspired me. So, okay, on his little psychedelic vision quest, he realizes that he wants to go even further back to Alexa than Alexander the Great to the actual Egyptian pharaohs themselves and be inspired by them. Uh, notice again, right, this is something that a character like Rorschach would never, ever do, right? You know that Rorschach would be part of those dare ads of just say no to drugs, right? Um, whereas Veidt, again, kind of siding more on the liberal side of things, is down with this, uh, with this experimentation with psychedelics and drugs, which is certainly part of the leftist hippie movement. Not that Veidt is really a hippie, but certainly he's more in that direction than, say, Rorschach. He says, what intellectual magnificence their system encouraged. Um, and so he realizes the Egyptians were super great um, and that they gave all their secrets to their servants. And this inspires him to adopt Ramses II's Greek name, Ozymandias, and Alexander's freebooting style. And he resolved to apply antiquity's teachings to today's world. So Ozymandias is kind of this symbol of reaching back to the greatness of the past to create a more utopian future. So he's simultaneously the most backward looking of any character and also the most future oriented of any character that we can see here. Um, and thus he began his conquest, not of men, but of the evils that beset them. So when I talk about the singularity of Veidt's purpose, we can see here that his entire being and his entire life's work and his, his entire will and, and the strength of that will is devoted to trying to solve the evils that beset mankind. Um, and he says today that conquest becomes assured uh, in which your unquestioning assistance has proven invaluable. All right. Um, and then we realize he has poisoned and killed them. Uh, which is, you know, we were, I think we were by this point getting some creepy vibes from Veidt in chapter 10. Um, and obviously Dryberg and Rorschach seem to find evidence that indicate that Veidt is involved. But now we know, right? Veidt probably is up to something that should make us deeply uncomfortable um, if he's killing his servants. And then he unleashes the snow on them. All right, so Rorschach and Veidt come on in. Again, just want to focus on Vite right now. We'll, we'll focus on the other characters in the next lecture. Um, and, you know, we, we see here uh, Vite, his, he, again, seems to be the closest to having superhuman strength besides Dr. Manhattan, obviously. But in terms of just the regular human beings, super impressive stuff, right? He sees Rorschach sneaking up on him, uh, gets him with a fork, smacks him in the face. Uh, Night Owl tries to shoot, I don't even know what this is, like a little laser thing at him. Um, Vite blocks it, takes out Night Owl, and so pretty much instantly, without much effort, he can take down the other heroes. And then he starts another long monologue. So I'm sorry. Uh, I, know, I know this is a lot here, um, but hopefully you got that other point um, that... Not only does he have a singularity of purpose, which I'm about to explain in a second as we, as we understand the exact specifics of his plan, which is obviously very important for the final discussion we're going to have, um, but also, right, we're getting a sense that he seems to be willing to have the ends justify the means. What does that mean, to have the ends justify the means? Well, if you believe that you could do something good, uh, even if you have to do something bad to achieve that, if the good outcomes end up being better, then that's fine. And so in this way, this is a very Nietzschean idea, which I'll I'll talk about very shortly here, he's willing to go beyond good and evil to achieve his goals. He's not constrained by petty forms of morality. He's willing to lean into moral ambiguity and moral grayness as a way of achieving ends that seem good. Um, and he says, this is from an end chapter excerpt, I believe Rorschach is a man of great integrity, but he seems to see the world in very black and white, Manichean terms. I believe personally that to be an intellectual limitation. So Veidt critiques Rorschach for being limited in terms of his moral horizons of having strict senses of good and evil, whereas Veidt is willing to do away with those conventional, um, with those conventional categories and create his own sense of morality. Um, and I would also argue that the Arctic ice setting is a good, is a good uh, setting that on a figurative level mirrors 
this uh, leaning, the, the way in which Veidt leans into moral ambiguity. As the reporter says, as he comes to Antarctica in the end chapter excerpt, he says, the landscape was hard and cold, too big to get to grips with, and I expected much of the same of any man who'd choose to live in it. So again, getting to this idea of superhuman, I think another way of looking at it is perhaps Veidt is inhuman, all right? Um, and the coldness, the bigness, the hardness of Antarctica seems to symbolize something that, that most humans really shouldn't inhabit. And certainly Veidt's actions of unleashing an alien monster on New York seems to be in that same line of figurative associations, of it being hard and cold and too big to come to grips with. There seems to be something cruel and calculative, calculated there that should make us uncomfortable in the same way that living in, in Antarctica would too. Um, also, you know, fun, fun connection as well, Frankenstein, the text ends, I guess not in Antarctica, it ends in the Arctic in the North region, but still it ends in a region of ice, which again, I think figuratively associates with that, um, with that imagery of entering into these inhuman terrains. Uh, yeah. So anyways, let's, let's continue. So Veidt now explains his plan, all right? What has he been trying to do? What we've all been trying to do? Improve the world, like when I started out. My first case made it seem possible to end injustice by demolishing crime syndicates. This notion that criminals monopolize evil was itself demolished by my second case, all right? So he starts to investigate the disappearance of hooded justice, but he can't find him, right? So instead, an operative, a government sources revealed, had tried unearthing him back then reporting failure. So Veidt learns that some operative from the government had tried to find him. So Veidt goes after that operative. Unearthing the operative, tracking him to Dockland proved easier. Turns out it was Edward Blake. As intelligent men facing lunatic times, we were very much alike, despising each other instantly. Recognizing me, he attacked anyway, mistaking me for a criminal. I studied his limitations. Skillful, faint, devastating uppercut, little else. He won in the short term. Had Blake found Hooded Justice, killed him, reporting failure? I can prove nothing. So, okay, we're getting hints that, that uh, Eddie Blake might have killed Hooded Justice, he, even, if we don't have, um, even if we don't have evidence. But we find out that in their first fight, <coughs> uh, Veidt lost. Now, obviously, he'll get the last laugh. Um, and so he keeps, he keeps uh, observing various characters, various political entities. Let's keep going. Um, we all, whoops, we all realized then how bad things were. I continued adventuring, but it seemed hollow. I fought only the symptoms, leaving the disease itself unchecked. Okay, again, we've talked about this. I despised myself, my sham cru crusade, knowing mankind's problems, I'd blinded myself to them. I felt helpless against forces greater than any I'd anticipated. Too cowardly to confront my anxieties, I had life's black comedy explained to me by the comedian himself at the Crime Busters fiasco in 66. I'm sure you remember. So this is returning to ideas we discussed at the very beginning of the graphic novel. The, the, uh, the impotence, the powerlessness of individuals in the face of these larger problems that are confronting the world in the 20th and now 21st century. He discussed nuclear war's inevitability, described my future role as smartest guy on the cinder, and opened my eyes. So obviously a symbol of knowledge. Only the best comedians accomplish that. <clears throat> I remember the charred maps between my fingers, Nelson saying, someone's got to save the world, his tremulous, complaining voice. That's when I understood. That's when it hit me. Consoling Nelson, I left outside. Blake argued with Lori and her mother. I swore to deny his kind their last black laugh at Earth's expense. I also swore that when next I met Blake or any other foe, though perhaps not on my territory, it would certainly be on my terms. Ominous. Okay, so let's keep going. We get more insight. He says, Brutally, I'd been brought nose to nose with mankind's mortality, the dreadful, irrefutable fact of it. So Veidt's recognizing here. He's saying the comedian made him realize the fragility of human existence and the possible inevitability of extinction. For the first time, I genuinely understood that Earth might die. I recognized the fragility of our world in increasingly hazardous times. And yet, what could I do? Again, that question. What can individuals do about global warming? What can you do to stop the U.S. and USSR from going to nuclear war? He says, my first step was to stand back as far as I could to view the problem from a fresh perspective, my vista widening with my comprehension. I saw East and West locked in an escalating arms spiral, their mutual terror and suspicion mounting with the missiles, making the possibility of disarmament remotely or progressively more remote. So, okay, he's going to give us a number of premises here. All right. Premise number one. 
uh, U.S. and Soviet Union, or just, you know, Western democracies and communist uh, regimes, are locked in an escalating arms race, and that will lead to just buying purchasing and developing more and more and more missiles, which will make the possibility of getting rid of nukes uh, ever more remote, right? Ever more impossible. Gradually, I close upon the heart of the dilemma. Here was a not to try even Alexander's ingenuity. So this problem, this seemingly insolvable conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union uh, is the Gordian knot that, that Veidt is going to try to solve. Both sides realized the suicidal implications of nuclear conflict, yet couldn't stop racing towards it lest their opponents should overtake them. Afraid of their weapons, afraid of losing them, afraid to blink or turn their backs. So this is the dilemma that every, I think, nation state in the modern world faces, all right? Even if the state believes in the possibility of peace, right, or wants to create a utopian future where states no longer have to go to war, well, what, what is always the risk? Well, if we get rid of our army entirely, what happens if another country tries to, tries to invade us? So then you have to develop, you know, weapons, a standing army, military equipment, so on and so forth, um, because of the risk that somebody else might try to use military against you. As soon as you're trapped in that dilemma, it is an impossible spiral to ever untangle, right? Um, Meanwhile, expensive arsenals meant less cash to spend upon their old, their sick and homeless, on their children's education. So, okay, spending all this money on military means that we're not investing in the population. As stockpiles grew, as computers reduced human involvement, the specter of accidental apocalypse stalked ever closer. All right, so the, the threat of an accidental nuclear war becomes greater. Simply given the mathematics of the situation, sooner or later conflict would be inevitable. So we have to understand, right, Veidt, again, is not a naive utopian. He recognizes the seeming inevitability of conflict. However, without a practical solution at hand, what use was it to suddenly notice the perils of the situation? Similarly, a solution would be equally useless. Like, just if Veidt said, everybody, get rid of your nuclear weapons, um, that wouldn't work, right? Unless one backed the muscle to back it, unless one possessed the muscle to back it up, the brute power to see one's will implemented. Again, that language of will being implemented uh, here. I took another step back and thought again. So Veidt is saying any solution is doomed to failure unless there's some way to back it up with actual muscle, unless there's some way to actually implement it. But how can you implement some sort of solution that stops these huge forces of the U.S. federal government and the Soviet Union from launching nuclear bombs? So he takes another step back. Other factors emerged. Arms expenditures boosted international lending rates. To repay soaring debt interest, nations like Brazil leveled their forests. So, okay, now he's take, taking a look at the economic implications of arm expenditures. Nuclear power providing vital weapons-grade waste became mandatory. War aside, atomic deadlock guided us downhill towards environmental ruin. So Veidt is also noting that the situation is accelerating environmental catastrophe, right? And obviously in the 21st century, even if the specter of nuclear war um, doesn't seem as, as present as it did during the Cold War, certainly this process of environmental catastrophe seems ever present and looming. John's presence accelerated this, though less than you'd imagine. Any significant power imbalance would yield similar results. Nevertheless, he symbolized mankind's problems. As tensions rose, the elevation of costumes heroes became a descent. I foresaw that by the late 70s, it would reach bottom. This left 10 years to build a fortune and reputation to sustain me beyond that point, allowing me the power and leverage I'd surely need. So, okay, Veidt predicts the direction everything's going in, that superheroes were going to be outlawed. So he had 10 years about before extinction would become a possibility, and he would have to amass his fortune and implement his plan there. Um, so he creates his company. My plan required preparation for the day when I would assume the aspect of kingly Ramses, leaving Alexander the adventurer and his trappings to gather dust. Each step had to be taken carefully, constantly striving to keep in mind the enormous scale of what was at stake. So Veidt recognizes what's at stake here, right? The earth, humanity, all we've ever known. End of the world does this concept no justice. The world's present would end. Its future immeasurably vaster would also vanish. Even our past would be canceled. Our struggle from the primal ooze, every childbirth, every personal sacrifice rendered meaningless, leaning only to dust, tossed on the void winds. Save for Richard Nixon, whose name adorns a plaque upon the new moon, no human vestige would remain. 
Ruins become sand, sand billows away, all of our richness and color and beauty would be lost as if it had never been. So some pretty powerful statements of the, of the real dangers of extinction, right? Everything that has ever existed would be done, right? Would, would uh, disappear forever. And so we're seeing the truly apocalyptic, um, the apocalypse being confronted here um, in a very candid way. All right, we're almost at the end of his speech. It says, each step was synchronized. John being too powerful and unpredictable to fit my plans needed removing. Thus, dimensional developments hired my his past associates and gave them cancer. Uh, yes, Wally first, Slater and Moloch later. So we find out that a uh, Vite was behind all of the cancer, right? It, it wasn't that John was giving people cancer. It was all a conspiracy. It was a plot. He is the deep state. Uh, since John proved teleportation possible, why develop electric cars? My researches were vital, like my island, secretly purchased in 1970. The only hero retaining public sympathy, I quit two years before the Keen Act, concentrating on my plan. Unable to unite the world by conquest, Alexander's method, I would trick it, frighten it towards salvation with history's greatest practical joke. And remember, now we're seeing the comedian because this is the practical joke that broke even the comedian. Um, that's what upset the comedian. His awareness of my scheme crashed in upon him. Professional jealousy. Blake's murder, you confess, says Rorschach. And Vite very coldly says, confession implies penitence. I merely regret his accidental involvement. So Vite does not feel guilty about killing the comedian. He only regrets that the comedian had to get involved at all. Okay, and so we find out, right, as the comedian was returning from Nicaragua, he, he uh, resolves to investigate the island. And Veidt says, I picture him swimming to the island, dagger in teeth, penetrating its installments. What he found must have come as a terrible blow. Imagine the perfect fighting man discovering a plot to end, a plot to put an end to war, an end to fighting. Um, how could genetics and teleportation end war? Asked Night Owl. Well, without John's guiding mind, teleportation proved limited. Anything living died of shock upon transfer or materialized into an occupied space and exploded. But that wasn't what Blake found on the island. He found a collection of missing artists and scientists working upon a monstrous new life form. Upon learning the creature's intended purpose, Blake's practice cynicism cracked. Though appalled, exposing my plan would precipitate greater horrors, preventing humanity's salvation. Even Blake balked at that responsibility, telling only Moloch, who he knew wouldn't understand. But I had Moloch's place bugged, and I understood perfectly. The plan Blake had uncovered was this, to frighten governments into cooperation. I would convince them that Earth faced imminent attack by beings from another world. Okay, so when we're talking about unconventional means, um, resorting to, uh, you know, morally ambiguous plans, we can see here Veidt's alien monster plot seems to perfectly fit that, right? Um, he says, an intractable problem can only be resolved by stepping beyond conventional solutions. Alexander understood that 2,000 years ago in Gordium. Blake understood too. He knew my plan would succeed, though its scale terrified him. That's why he told nobody. It was too big to discuss, but he understood. At the end, he understood. He understood the portents, knew a dazzling transformation was at hand for mankind. The brutal world he'd relished would simply cease to be, its fierce and brawling denizens rushing to join the Mastodon in obsolescence, in extinction. So Veidt here is arguing that all of this human conflict, all of this suffering and pain that is at the root of the seemingly insoluble problems uh, and conflicts of the world as he sees it will be solved through his solution. This is linking to the, his idea of the utopia. He is truly trying to solve the root causes of evil and conflict and suffering within the world. Um, so what, what does he do here? Do, do, do. We find out he had hired his own killer um, to make it seem as if uh, that he was not the one who had perpetuated this. Um, and Night Owl says, Adrian, this is crazy. Who'd believe an alien invasion? And now Veidt quotes Hitler, which is never good, all right? If you find yourself quoting Hitler as a way to justify your actions, I, I think you know you're in a morally problematic place. And he says, Hitler said people swallow lies easily, provided they're big enough. I plan to build my monster, teleport it to a certain destination. And, Vi and Rorschach says, said teleportation unworkable. And Veidt says, it works fine, assuming you want things to explode upon arrival. Teleported to New York, my creature's death would trigger mechanisms within its massive brain, cloned from a human sensitive. The resultant psychic, psychic shockwave killing half the city. 
Night Owl says, Adrian, I'm sorry, you need help. I know this half New York stuff is bullshit, but I'm still glad we got here before we got deeper into this mess. Christ, you seriously planned all this mad scientist stuff? I mean, when was this hopeless black fantasy supposed to happen? When were you going to do it? And great lines from Vite. He says, do it. Dan, I'm not a republic serial vision. Uh, republic serial, right? That would have been comic book. Serial being like published every week or whatever. Republic being, um, you know, a company. And so he's saying here, I'm not a comic book villain. Of course he is. Do you seriously think I'd explain my master stroke if there remained the slightest chance of you affecting its outcome? I did it 35 minutes ago. So this would have shocked readers at the time because every single graphic novel or superhero, right? Imagine if in, in a Marvel movie this happened where all of a sudden it just ends with, uh, this would have been like if Endgame, or sorry, if um, the Avengers series had literally just ended in Infinity War. If that had been the end and there had been no Endgame and it just ended with Thanos snapping his fingers, that's what this is like, that he had already done it. Because almost always, right, we're used to the convention, the evil mastermind at the end and the climax explains his evil plan and the superheroes in the nick of time are able to stop him. Um, but instead we find out that it has already happened and he has let off the bomb. So, whew. And we're going to have to discuss the exact implications of that um, in just a moment here. Um, just a couple of other quotes to kind of help us here in terms of Veidt's unconventional morality or willing to step beyond conventions of morality. Um, Veidt says, as they're approaching Night Owl and Rorschach, he says, it must be so disorienting. Their pursuit leads them deeper into moral and intellectual regions as uncharted and devoid of landmark as the territories currently surrounding them. So Veidt really connects the dots between the Arctic, unexplored, uh, inhuman terrain and the moral, uh, the moral, the zone of moral ambiguity that he seems to exist in. Um, Rorschach says, if Veidt truly engineering third world war, we are approaching heart of darkness a good reference to Joseph Conrad's novel, which inspired Apocalypse Now, uh, which deals with these same themes of moral ambiguity. Um, and of course, the quote that we already looked at, where uh, Veidt says, true people died at the hands of Alexander the Great, uh, perhaps unnecessarily, though who can judge such things? And I think these final ones give me, um, give me the connections I need to connect Veidt. Philosophically, I, I think he represents a, a certain idea, which I want to discuss very briefly here. Um, but hopefully you have a good sense over the various characteristics of, of Veidt, um, because I think it's very easy to just kind of ask Veidt's plan. Do we agree with it? Do we not agree with it? But I think we can deepen our understanding of this discussion and this debate through really understanding all of the characteristics of Veidt, especially his utopian vision of the future, um, as well as now what I'll, what I'll explain is philosophically what he seems to represent. Um, and this brings us back to our boy, Friedrich Nietzsche, all right? So, and this is the idea of the Ubermensch, if you have ever heard this term before. And I wanna briefly explain it because I think Veidt, more than any other character in the graphic novel, is certainly embodying this idea. And I think Alan Moore is doing this intentionally. In the same way that uh, Dr. Manhattan becomes a spokesperson for the philo philosophy of determinism, and Rorschach is an existentialist and the comedian's a nihilist, I think Veidt here, um, though we'll see that there is some hints of utilitarianism at the end, which I'll discuss in the next slide, Lecture. Um, in terms of his characteristic and his personality, he is embodying this idea of the Ubermensch, and um, I'll explain what that is. So the Ubermensch is a difficult word to translate, and the best translation would probably be over man, but the way in which it was translated into English for a long, long time is Superman, and this is actually where that term Superman comes from. Um, and so what we'll see here, though, is that Nietzsche was not talking about physical strength in any way, shape, or form. He was talking about a psychological strength. Um, but it's quite humorous that this, when you hear the word Superman, you imagine the guy who can, fast, who can fly faster than a speeding bullet, um, who has these superhuman powers in terms of strength. Um, so obviously, what does that say about the American psyche, that we transformed this psychological concept into a physical one? I'll leave that up to you, but it's interesting. So Nietzsche, as we've explored at many points throughout this class, um, is confronting or, or, or articulates the core problem, the spiritual crisis confronting the West, um, especially in the world of modernity, is the death of God. 
uh, and we understand this, right? Which is the idea um, that which is the idea that religion and God can no longer sustain a moral order or value system. There seems to be no objective or inherent meaning in the world. And so the danger that Nietzsche is confronting is that of nihilism, of how can we confront a world where we no longer have a basis for meaning, where we no longer have the belief in objective or inherent values? How can we overcome that meaninglessness of the universe and not slide into, say, the comedian's response to the world, um, which is pure and utter nihilism? Um, and the Ubermensch is Nietzsche's solution. Now, obviously, one of the most immediate connections we can draw with Veidt are these rhetorical connotations, right? Of Veidt being refer referred to consistently as being extraordinary or superhuman more than any other character in the graphic novel. Um, that said, everything I'm about to explain, I feel a little bad because Nietzsche is very complex and he's notoriously uh, elusive and difficult to really grasp down to concrete specifics due to his writing style. He writes almost as if his philosophy is a work of literature. It's a poetic, almost fictional way. He uses aphorisms and parables and metaphors. So it's hard to pin him down to literally exactly what he what this looks like, this idea of the Ubermensch. And part of Nietzsche's scholars have done really interesting work to show that Actually, Nietzsche's difficult style is part of his point. He doesn't want a prescriptive solution of what everyone should do, but instead to create uh, an inspiration through his literary modes. But uh, So I just understand, right, if this seems a little bit weird in terms of how I explain it, notice that's because a lot of it is metaphorical. A lot of it is figurative. Nietzsche is trying to inspire us through ideas and figurative language as opposed to a direct prescription. Um, but let, let's take a look at a quote from Nietzsche that kind of sets up this idea. Um, and this is from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the novel where Nietzsche first, uh, or not novel, is a philosophical work where he first introduces this idea. And he argues here that man is a rope, okay, tied between beast and ubermensch, the overman, a rope over an abyss. So this abyss that we are going over is the abyss of nihilism, okay? And we are on a rope, which obviously implies great danger. Um, and we have two directions we could go in. We could either slide back into being an animal, a beast, or we could go in the direction of the overman. The key point here is that we are transitional. We are not born as a static thing. We're always in a state in Nietzsche's mind of becoming. And he says, a dangerous across, a dangerous on the way, a dangerous looking back, a dangerous shuddering and stopping. So notice, all this language is of movement and of danger. What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not an end, all right? What is great about humanity is that we can transform, we can become something different, we can change ourselves through the strength of our will. What can be loved in man is that he is a going over, okay? And so this language of the overman or the superman uh, in Nietzsche's writing is all about overcoming ourselves in a certain way. And so what, what does that mean um, to overcome ourselves? Well, let's keep going. So I'm going to explain here. You should leave a fair amount of room in your notes for this because there's going to be a fair amount on this slide. But this is the rope that we're stretched between, all right, between beast and ubermensch. And we can go in various directions. And that's what we're going to explore here. Now, the direction the, that Nietzsche was very deeply concerned that we would go in would be towards that of what he called the last man, all right? And so Nietzsche argued that with the death of God, where we now have a void in the realm of morality and value, where we no longer have a source of objective moral value or of order of purpose in the world, we, we've seen these beliefs before, um, he believed that the danger would be that we would just accept that there are no values or meanings, and we would stop trying to create new values or meanings, and instead we'd sink into an almost a soft form of nihilism where we just embrace hedonism, all right? And we just seek mere happiness, comfort, a satisfaction of our momentary desires. Um, I think Fight Club does a good job of depicting what the last man looks like. The narrator or Edward Norton's character at the beginning of Fight Club very much depicts this this meaningless state of existence, right? That seems to be pathetic. And I think this term last man has two connotations. First, Nietzsche, I think, very much would believe that this would be the end of humanity, because it would be so pathetic, it would lead to our demise. Uh, perhaps that's a little too literal. I think second, the connotation is this is the last human who is still human. It is the last man before we have become an unthinking beast again, right? Because by just trying to satisfy our mere happiness or desires or comfort, we are not so different than an animal, like a dog that just wants to pursue pleasure, right? Um, we no longer are thinking. We no longer are creating. 
And so Nietzsche said, this is what needs to be overcome, not just the nihilism, but also these, uh, these drives for just pure happiness. And so he, he outlines these three stages of self-overcoming, as he calls them. Um, and another way he calls it is the metamorphosis of the spirit. So let's take a look here. The first <clears throat> stage is that of the camel. Um, and again, this is all metaphorical. He's not saying you're literally going to be a camel. Um, and taking this too literally is like you are in the camel stage, you know, I think misses a little bit of the point. But uh, nevertheless, I, I think these metaphors are quite useless to envisioning what the various stages are. And so the camel is dutiful, is the dutiful spirit that is burdened and carrying the weight of values it did not choose. So this is traditions, religion, God. Um, and the camel is all about obeying thou shalt commands. So the camel is above the last man, right? Because the camel still has values. But the camel is not seen as being terribly impressive because um, it is carrying values that no longer seem to have, uh, that no longer seem relevant in the world anymore after the death of God. And so it is still carrying those old values even though they're outdated. And that's what makes the camel so, so burdened. So this would be like if you went to Sunday school throughout your whole life or you went to, you know, a religious school or your parents took you to church or temple or whatever, whatever it is, and you just sort of believed in those values without ever questioning them. You just kind of obey what your parents tell you or you obey what society tells you or you obey, uh, you know, what religious figures tell you without ever questioning it. You would be in the camel stage, okay? You are just obeying commands, right? Someone says, you shall do this, and you say, okay, without questioning it. Um, now, obviously, if you actually confront the implications of the world of modernity, you would see why being in the camel stage would be problematic, so the second stage is that what Nietzsche calls the lion. And the lion is strong. It battles against external values. It liberates oneself from those you shall commands, okay? And the way it does that is through uttering what Nietzsche refers to as a sacred no. All these quotes, by the way, are taken from Nietzsche himself. Um, now, the issue with the lion, the lion seems pretty, pretty impressive, right? And again, going back to Fight Club... Tyler Durden would be the character of the lion, one who can liberate oneself from these external or shallow constraints of society or of, of other forms of authority, right? It frees oneself from, from these values through destruction. And this is actually one of the problems with the lion, which I think is ends up being the problem with Tyler Durden, uh, and the reason why the narrator turns away from Tyler at the end of Fight Club, is, is Tyler is purely destructive. He cannot create new values. He only destroys old ones, and he orients his entire personality against that. I would say the Joker is another character um, who could be in this lion stage, or the comedian in Watchmen, right? All those characters who can be quite... Per, uh, quite compelling and, and persuasive in certain ways because uh, of their resistance to, um, to these values that seem outdated. Uh, nevertheless, there's something incomplete about them because they're only caught in saying no to things and destroying things as opposed to trying to build anything. The third stage then, the stage before the Ubermensch, is that of the child. Again, all, metaphor, uh, all metaphors meant to have figurative associations that help us to understand the various stages one should enter in on the path towards the Ubermensch. Um, and Nietzsche says the child is innocence and forgetting, a new beginning, a self-propelled wheel, a first movement, a sacred yes. For the game of creation, a sacred yes is needed. So notice here, this is all about a creation of new values through childlike play, newborn innocence, authenticity. Um, one of Nietzsche's biggest inspirations in his writing was Ralph Waldo Emerson. And obviously the transcendentalists, if you remember, uh, very much valued the image of the child as that which we should all aspire to. Adults have become jaded in a certain way, have become incapable of viewing the world through an imaginative lens that could create new values. Uh, whereas Emerson and Nietzsche both see value in that newborn innocence and that childlike play. Now, the transcendentalists probably would just end here at number three. Uh, Nietzsche will take it one step further, as we'll see in just a moment. Um, but hopefully this, this gives us a little bit of a glimpse of the direction that Nietzsche wanted us to head. Um, and I think the important thing to understand here is that 
the progression from beast to ubermensch is not guaranteed and it is not inevitable. It has to be willed and can only be achieved by the most psychologically strong individuals, those who are willing to, as Nietzsche says, overcome themselves. Um, but he would say it's probably much easier to slide into the state of the last man. And if we were to ask ourselves in 2020, where do most people seem to be? Do they seem to go in this direction of a self-reliance that creates new values and, and battles for one's own freedom by rejecting values imposed upon it, or do people more slide into this of just trying to seek their momentary desires and satisfy their physical happiness? Um, I think probably most people would agree that the majority of individuals slide in this direction, um, unfortunately, in Nietzsche's view. So let's get to the final stage, the Ubermensch. So for Nietzsche, he believed that it wasn't just enough to be in the childlike stage where you create a new value and say, you know, this is the value I want to believe in from here on out. It's pretty easy to just say that, right? You could just say, I believe in X, right? I, I believe in wanting to do something. Like I believe in wanting to write a novel or something like that, or I believe in freedom, or I believe in happiness. Um, but he said, he argued that the true ubermensch, right, the one who has overcome oneself, is the one who integrates those values into a coherent commitment to a way of life based on those values. So it's not enough to simply think of a belief or say that you agree with a value. You have to embody that value through your actions and the way you live. Um, and so that requires orienting your entire life around that value. And this is where hopefully you're starting to see some connections to Veidt. Um, the only other thing I have to explain here before we can truly understand the Ubermensch is Nietzsche's understanding of the self. Um, because this will help us to understand what it means to embody a value through one's actions and ways of living. And Nietzsche, again, writing at the end of the 1800s, precursor to so many of the modern philosophers, um, argued that our essence, right, our innermost being, the thing that defines what it means to be human, is actually not our soul, as religious thinking would believe. And it's not our self-conscious ego, which is your rationality and thoughts. That's what most people like to believe they are, right? You like to believe that when you think about yourself, who am I? You think through your conscious thoughts that you have and the conscious experiences that you can remember. And Nietzsche would argue that that's actually not the truest essence of yourself. That's a part of yourself, but not your essence. And neither is the soul. The essence of oneself is actually your body. And hopefully you see the connection to Freud here. Um, because Nietzsche argues that your body is actually made up of conflicting passions and energies and drives and forces which are constantly struggling for control and for expression through yourself. And this is an idea we've discussed through Freud before, which is the idea that, that you are not a unified, coherent entity, but you are divided against yourself. You're constantly at war with yourself, right? On the one hand, you desire to be a stellar student. Right? And you have these desires to be great, to do impressive things, to become famous, to become admirable. On the other hand, you have desires to just eat pizza all day, and you have a desire to sit around and play video games, and you have a desire to be lazy, and you have a desire to be mean to people, and sometimes you have a desire to be compassionate and selfless. And so all of these different conflicting passions and energies and drives and forces are what make up humanity in Nietzsche's mind. Now, what does this understanding of the self have anything to do with everything I was just talking about? Is this just a random tangent? No. Um, for Nietzsche, the measure of a great individual, a true ubermensch, is one who can create a hierarchical organization or a ranking of your passions and energies and integrate them in service of one drive or one master passion. Okay, and so the example I like to use here is that of a chariot. <clears throat> Imagine your conflicting passions and energies and drives and forces, all the different directions that your body kind of takes you in throughout the day, right? Um, imagine those as horses and you yourself are a guy with, uh, at, at, the heart, at, at the forefront of the chariot trying to lead these horses. Now, let's say your value that you want to dedicate yourself to, all right? Let's say the master drive, the master passion that you want to devote your entire sense of self to, the value that you want to define your life is to be a pro NBA player, all right? You want to be the next Steph Curry. You want to be the next Kobe Bryant. You want to be the next Michael Jordan. Now, in order to do that, in order to become truly great uh, at that particular feat, it, you would have to rank, you would have to devote all of your passion and energy in that direction. Now imagine, you have one horse that wants to be a pro NBA player, but what do you do about the other horses who want to be lazy, who want to eat pizza all day, who just want to play video games? 
if you let those horses go in their own direction, <clears throat> right, and you have one horse going in the direction of trying to be a pro basketball player, another horse going in the direction of wanting to be lazy, another horse in the, going in the direction of wanting to eat junk food, what's going to happen? You're not going to go into any direction, right? You're going to be stuck. And so for Nietzsche, he viewed most people as actually not being able or, or I, at least not applying the will and determination to get their horses moving in the same direction, right? Um, instead, what he thought of, uh, what he believed is that through your strength of will, if you create a value system that moves all those metaphorical horses, your drives, your energies, your passion in the same direction, you would be capable of enormously impressive feats. You'd be able to maximize all those energies. And if you get them going in one direction, you'll go incredibly fast. I mean, not that speed is the goal here, but it's about power. And that's what Nietzsche viewed as true power, not as control over other people or an accumulation of wealth, but the discipline to be able to direct all of your body's energies and passions for one singular purpose based on values that you yourself have created. And so Nietzsche viewed meaning as emerging through the ability to embody a lifestyle around a certain set of values, that it was through the living of those values that generated meaning in the first place. Um, so let's, let's summarize some of these core ideas. Uh, and, and notice the basketball example, the, the one thing I want to say about that, that was a physical example, but it doesn't matter if it's being a pro basketball player, whether it's making sushi, whether it's becoming a writer, whether it's becoming a YouTube star, whether it's making music, whether it's becoming a salesman, so on and so forth. It doesn't matter what it is, but the idea of the Ubermensch is it's not about physical strength. It's about the psychological determination and discipline to direct the entirety of your body's energies in the direction of the value of the dominant value that you prioritize over all other drives and passions of your body. And so the challenge for the Ubermensch is to stare unflinchingly into the abyss of meaninglessness in a world where God is no longer a compelling basis for values, meaning, and morality, okay? You can't delude yourself into believing in values that no longer are compelling. Instead, the Ubermensch needs to create new values even though they lack foundation. And the way those values need to be chosen is through a liberty of freedom rather than being imposed on the outside. So for instance, if you just devoted yourself to being a doctor and you directed all your en energies in that direction, but you were only doing it because your parents wanted you to, Nietzsche wouldn't find that very admirable, right? The Ubermensch is one who is creating values for him or herself and is living out those values every day. And so those values must be created by creating ourselves. And this, imp and this implies supreme commitment and discipline. And so the Ubermensch is the one who can fashion new values for him or herself and shape the entirety of their actions around that value to make that value compelling. And this is the key idea, that idea of making it compelling. It's not enough to just say, hey, guys, like, I just want to be, you know, the best pizza maker, but then, like, just make DiGiorno pizzas all day, right? Instead, you have to really shape your entire life around it, and it doesn't matter what you do. If you do it in such uh, a, an admirable way through such psychological determination and you devote your entire being to that, you can truly make that value compelling, right? If you've seen Hero Dreams of Sushi, that, that would be a good example of making something such as making sushi, which I'm guessing few of you imagine dedicating your life to, into something that becomes quite admirable as a feat of, of the supreme um, impressiveness of the human will. And so this is the final idea is that Nietzsche believed that through this psychological strength and determination, the Ubermensch would usually become the one who, revol who revolutionizes the world or changes culture in some way, right? And so will lead to cultural, intellectual, and political transformations through their strength of will. And so who are the types of people that Nietzsche would point at as kind of approaching this idea. Well, it would be great political people like Napoleon, um, who absolutely revolutionized France. Now, we can get into a debate about whether he was a dictator, whether we think his changes were good or bad, but certainly Napoleon was a man who shaped not just France, but most of Europe to his will and absolutely transformed the politics of Europe. Um, going back to the to the monarchies never was the same after Napoleon because of the uh, because of the changes that he wrought on to the world, ruling in the name of the people as opposed to ruling in the name of a divine mandate from God, all right? Now, you can get into debates about whether Napoleon is good or bad. That's not the interesting thing here. The, the key thing is, is uh, Nietzsche absolutely saw Napoleon as someone who devoted himself to transforming the world. 
Um, obviously, Vite would view someone like Alexander the Great or the Egyptian pharaohs like Ramses II, Ozymandias, as fitting into this great ubermensch category. Um, Nietzsche also probably would point to someone like Caesar, but also great thinkers and writers like uh, Da Vinci or this German writer, Goethe, who not well known in America, at least you know, on a high school level, um, but certainly one of the most famous German writers, uh, right? Nietzsche absolutely saw someone like that as being an ubermensch figure who directed their entire life's work towards uh, one singular goal. Um, and so hopefully you're noticing as well some similarities uh, with existentialism. Um, Nietzsche, I think, not only inspired Freud, but also inspired deeply the existentialists. And if you were to take a class on existentialism in college, you would probably start maybe not with Nietzsche. You'd probably start with characters like Kierkegaard um, or thinkers like Kierkegaard. But Nietzsche would be early in the curriculum as a kind of precursor to the existentialist thoughts. And I think this idea of staring into the inherent meaninglessness of the world and choosing to create values yourself is very similar with the existentialism that we were looking at. Um, and so, uh, you know, what would be some examples of an Ubermensch from our day? I'd be really curious to have this discussion um, and hear your thoughts. Like maybe some of you would think a Kobe Bryant could embody that, someone who devoted, who had the discipline to devote their entire being towards one value, one goal. Maybe a Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk, some of those tech figures for some of you um, could embody that belief. And again, notice that maybe not Kobe, but Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Napoleon, typically these people are deeply controversial um, because the creation of their own values might go up against what other people want to believe in. Uh, and so that brings us to Veidt, right? Veidt clearly, um, this has been a long-winded way of connecting Veidt to this philosophical school of thought from Nietzsche, that of the Ubermensch, of overcoming nihilism. Um, clearly, Veidt has the superhuman capabilities. He has the psychological devotion, the extreme discipline, the strength, the focus, the intelligence, the transformation of the world. Moreover, he integrates all aspects of himself, all of his drives and passions towards his goal. And I really think the emphasis on the synthesis of his mind, his body, his soul, the mastery over his body is exactly goes in line with what Nietzsche was saying in terms of overcoming those various drives and forces and energies of the body and directing them in one in one direction. Moreover, he acts beyond conventional morality. He goes beyond good and evil, which implies that he has stared into the abyss of the lack of any sort of objective moral order to the universe, right? He does not abide by the conventional God-given standards of good and evil. Instead, he creates his own morality. Um, and he's not just a destroyer. He hopes to create a new utopian world. And so I think all of these things were getting pretty good uh, glimpses into what's going on with, with Veidt and how he how he embodies this. Um, and so I think certainly we have to admit that there is there are admirable qualities to Adrian Veidt as his character of Ozymandias. He is deeply impressive, impressive in terms of his discipline and, uh, and, and devotion to his task. Um, now the question that I think Veidt is asking, or, or Alan Moore is forcing us to ask is, is this concept of the Ubermensch an aspiration that we should reach towards? Like with all the other philosophies that we've encountered, the comedian's nihilism, Dr. Manhattan's determinism, Rorschach's existentialism, um, I think Alan Moore brilliantly conveys the extreme cases of what certain philosophical beliefs could justify if taken to the extreme to raise questions of whether we're really comfortable with that philosophy. So, for instance, I think Adrian Veidt raises the question of whether we feel comfortable with the character of the Ubermensch or this philosophical school of thought of the Ubermensch um, if there are not moral checks, right? Because I think Adrian Veidt, it would be an interesting debate whether or not we think Nietzsche would actually like Veidt or not, whether he think, whether he would be horrified by Veidt or say Veidt is deeply impressive. But regardless... Um, the question is, right, are there any moral checks on the Ubermensch? If the Ubermensch is truly staring at a world without God, is there any way to justify if, if one devotes their entire life to a certain set of values, what happens if we find those values horrific, right? It would be one thing if, if someone devoted their life uh, through this philosophy of the Ubermensch towards charity, Okay, that, that could be Im incredible. And someone like a Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries could be an example of someone who is an Ubermensch in that direction. And when that's deeply admirable and something that absolutely we would love more people to embody. But what if 
someone devotes themselves to something deeply problematic like white supremacy and becomes an ubermensch acting or orienting their entire being in that direction, all right? What are the moral checks on the ubermensch? And can we even justify any sort of moral checks in this philosophy if there seems to be no basis for moral or ethical values? Um, these, these are problematic, these are problems that are difficult to solve, right? Um, and what I guess the key question we're getting to is under the framework of the ubermensch, what can we say is good or what could we say is bad? Or does morality become something that is relative and we just view people as either weak or strong based on how much, how close they get to this ideal? Um, and so hopefully you're seeing some of the same issues we saw with existentialism of what if somebody like Rorschach begins to embody values that make us kind of uncomfortable? What do we do? Is there any way to negate that? Um, these are questions that we're going to have to continue to parse through, but hopefully you have a better understanding now of Veidt and what he represents in terms of ideas. Um, in the next video, what I want to do is trace through his the, the outcome of his plan and the ways in which we would go about answering whether we think we agree with his plan or not, um, which I think gets to the heart of this question of trying to parse out questions of good and evil, of ethical deliberation, um, which which we're raising here. I, and we'll do some other close reading, finish tying the knot on uh, the Black Freighter, for instance, some of the other character stories, Rorschach's response, so on and so forth. Um, but hopefully you have a better understanding of Veidt. Hopefully you have a better understanding of Nietzsche's philosophy as a way to overcome nihilism. Um, hopefully we find some inspirational aspects of this philosophy, but also also um, remain determined to uncover and unearth some of the problems that might be there.